The Bible tells us that the trouble began a long, long time ago in a faraway place called Eden. And a moment in time when God made the extraordinary decision to create life and to create a place called earth where life could abound and thrive and joy could be experienced. And God created men and women and placed them in the garden and said, do you see all of this? It's all yours to enjoy. So go and live and make families and, and enjoy this beautiful place that I have given you. But that single tree in the center of the garden, do you see that? Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Do not eat from the fruit of that tree. Because on the day that you eat of it, you will die. And as soon as God turns his back and sets creation into motion, what exactly do those human beings want? Exactly what they can't have, right? Exactly what they can't have. And the rest, as they say, is history. This story is not about a particular man and a particular woman created by God at a particular moment in time. This story, my friends, is about you and about me. This story is an illustration of the human condition, of the fact that God created us in God's own image, made us as extraordinary creatures, and gave us the ability to say yes or no to God's life-giving invitation to be in relationship with the one who creates us and sustains us and loves us endlessly. God gave us the gift of free will for one simple reason, because God's entire desire, and the entirety of the Bible is witness to this, God's entire desire is for a relationship with us that is grounded in love and that we would extend that relationship out in our relationship with each other. But you can't coerce love. Anybody who's been in junior high knows you cannot convince somebody to like you if they just don't like you, right? No matter how many notes you pass them or put in their locker. You can't. It's not possible. Because a relationship is an invitation. And if God coerced us to respond to his invitation to us by insisting and commanding and forcing us to love God back, would that be love? No. And so God gave us the gift of free will and then spent the rest of time from that moment until now saying, I love you. I love you. I will give you the most abundant, joy-filled, fantastic life you can possibly imagine. Let me be the center of your life. Love me as I love you. And let's do this thing called life together. And the truth is that as soon as God looks the other way, what do we do? We want all the things that God has told us we should not have because they will not give us an abundant life. They will only make false promises to us and ultimately seek to destroy us. Am I speaking the truth here? Yeah, this story is about us. It's about the very nature of what we call sin. Our brokenness, 
that separation that we experience throughout our lives, our separation from God, from each other, from our very selves, that all comes out of our rebelliousness, our, our ability to listen to other voices that are constantly trying to seduce us and woo us to, to go where they want us to go. And God's voice gets lost. It gets lost in the noise for most of us, most of the time. Jesus stood before the leaders of his own people, the Jewish leaders, the temple, the temple leadership, these highly trained, highly qualified teachers of the Jewish law. He stood before them about ready to be crucified. Why? Because they, for generations, for centuries, the Jewish people had expected a different kind of Messiah. They had listened to the prophets who had promised them, God will come and fix the mess that you all have made of this world. God will send a Messiah. But what they thought they needed, what they wanted, was a warrior king who would ride into the midst of the Roman Empire and overthrow the emperor and everyone else who was so cruel to them and who kept them under their thumbs so powerfully. That was the kind of king, the kind of Messiah that they believed they wanted and needed. And what did they get instead? They got a Messiah in a robe and sandals. They got a Messiah named Jesus who spent his entire life teaching people about God's love healing those who were broken or sick, feeding all who were hungry, raising them from the dead, and showing them, showing them exactly what can come from a relationship with God, where that is the center of one's life. But God makes demands on us. God expects us to love God first before we love ourselves and then to love others, even those we don't like, even those we hate. And that's hard. And so rather than accept this new way of being in relationship with God, rather than recognize Jesus for who he was and everything he was bringing into creation, this amazing gift of abundant life and love, their response to Pilate was, crucify him, silence him once and for all. He is not the Messiah we want. Today, in just a few minutes, we will be pouring water and laying hands on Bellamia. Don't you love that name? Bellamia. It must, there must be a song called Bellamia. <laughs> this child who is, how old is she now? Uh, 11. 11, 11 weeks. Oh, so innocent so precious, so perfect, will be brought here to this water so that God can claim her in a new way, a public way, as God's own. God has already done that. God knew her before she was born. He knit her together in Jane's womb. But we want to name what God has done for her and the promises that, that God will make to her and that we will make to her today. And so we bring her here for this gift of baptism. I always tell parents as I'm talking to them about baptism before their child is baptized that um, it may seem confusing as to why we baptize a baby who is so perfect and precious and then I remind them, or tell them maybe for the first time, if they've never heard it before, that the first word their child will ever utter will probably be, no. 
Am I right, parents? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's the first word, but it's never the last. And so Bella, even at age 11 weeks, has been given this gift of free will from God, just like you and I have. And the day will come when, and she should do this, she begins to assert her independence and let the world know that she is in charge of her own life, thank you very much. And what she wants, she wants when she wants it and how she wants it. And we can all relate to that, can we not? And in the midst of that reality, which is so hard to accept looking at this beautiful 11-week-old child, but in the midst of that reality, that even Bella will experience what, it, what this, this sin that we're talking about, not the things she does, but the separation that they cause from God, from her parents, from herself. And that when God saw what that does to us as human beings who are created to be in relationship, God did the only thing that could be done to solve that problem. And it was the one thing we could not do for ourselves. He came into human existence in the person of Jesus and went to the cross to be raised from death to life so that none of us, including Bella, ever need to be afraid of him, ever need to think there is anything we can ever do or fail to do that will cause him to not love us and to assure her and us that his gift to us, whether we accept it or not, is a gift of eternal, abundant life. And so that is what baptism is all about. It's about so much more than a baptismal gown and a blanket and water and a party afterwards. It's the beginning of Bella's journey with Jesus today, where he will take her by the hand and walk with her wherever her journey takes her. And if she gets lost along the way, and she probably will, because haven't we all, he will guide her back to that place where she will experience the life he, he died for her to have. And when she gets back there, he will be there with arms wide open, saying, welcome home, daughter, welcome home. And so we rejoice and celebrate with Bella and her family and all of, of her friends gathered here today and with our Lord of Life family. And we entrust her to God's care so that she too can have the gift of eternal life that Jesus bought for her to have. And to that we say, thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>